uh, we are studying the book of Luke here. If you're a guest, we're so glad that you're here. We've just been studying this book of the Bible. It's called The Gospel According to Luke. And the Bible in the New Testament, which is sort of the second half that tells about Jesus and his story, starts with four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're all different accounts of Jesus. And if you're wanting to know Jesus more, I would encourage you to kind of get acquainted with, with one of those guys. We've been reading Luke. This is our 46th week, uh, and everybody here is loving it. Uh, totally so much uh, that we continue to press on. Uh, And so I wanted to read to you today, and I I need to tell you this, that at least for the next few weeks, the passages that we're reading in Luke hardly ever make it into Sunday morning services. They're obscure. They're not easily teachable. And so usually there's a guy like me who picks what we talk about on Sunday, and you skip over these. But somebody had this, you know, boneheaded idea that we were just gonna go all the way through and not skip anything. And so here we are. And what we're finding is that God truly does speak through his word, that it is the word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. And so I wanna invite you in a kind of a new kind of way to open up your heart to God's word, to some obscure verses that upon first reading for most people are like, what in the world is that talking about? Is that a great setup or what? Okay, so here we go. Luke chapter 11, verse 29. It says, when the crowds were increasing, he, that's, uh, uh, excuse me, that's Jesus, began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the son of man be to this generation. So, got it? Makes sense? No, it doesn't. We have to keep reading. It'll make less sense after I read this. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Now, I'm not trying to make light of this. In fact, I I, I think it's really incredible about what we're about to look at. I just wanna acknowledge when you read about the sign of Jonah and the queen of the south, for most people, even people who've studied the Bible for a while would say, what in the world are we talking about? And if you had what I would think is like an adequate and good preacher, they would skip over this and just say, let's just move on to something else. Um, And so we have said, you know, We're in Luke chapter 11, week 46, that we wanna go all in. We wanna see what this really says. And so today our task is gonna be a little bit different. We're gonna have to dig a little bit deeper and maybe even be a little bit keener with our minds and our hearts as we go through this. So I wanna give you a few things to think about as we walk through this. The first thing that we're gonna ask as we read it is, why was Jesus saying this? Why was he talking about Jonah? Why was he talking about Solomon uh, and the queen of the south? Which is not Dolly Parton, by the way, okay? I'm gonna tell you, okay? (laughs) Why is, he, why is he talking about this? Why? Then we're gonna look at what Jesus actually said. Because sometimes you can get confused about Jesus' words and start hearing what other people are saying about Jesus. We're gonna look at what he actually said. And then we're gonna try to, we probably won't get this completely right, we're gonna try to understand what Jesus actually meant by these scriptures. And then we're gonna ask ourselves, so what? So what does this have to do with our lives? So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna ask, why was Jesus saying it? What did he actually say? What did it actually mean? And then, so what? What does this mean for my life? So here's the scripture again, just one of the verses says, when the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. So it says, when the crowds were increasing, and that certainly means that more and more people were hearing about Jesus, but if you've been reading through the book of Luke like we have, or even if you had picked up this morning and said, I'm gonna read the book of Luke, and you did chapter one, two, three, four, five, as you got to chapter 11, you would realize that what's being said here, when the crowds were increasing, was not just saying there's more people, it's saying that there's, there's just more happening Uh, the pressure is mounting. That's what you feel when these crowds keep increasing and keep pushing against Jesus, that the pressure is mounting. We are no longer with, you know, the gentle Jesus around the Sea of Galilee meeting fishermen or going to parties with his friends and his families. He has set his face towards Jerusalem, which is where his execution will be. He knows that's where he's going. He knows that's what's happening. And so when it says the crowds were increasing, it means the pressure is mounting on Jesus. And the people 
people who are asking Jesus many of these questions are not asking him with innocent eyes. They're not just making a general inquiry of him when they're saying things like, hey, Jesus, do, do another sign, do something else. In fact, those people are trying, Jesus knows, to trick him. They are behind his back devising a plan for his demise. And so their words of question are really accusatory. And Jesus knows that. And that's why when we read this and Jesus' first thing out of his mouth is, you guys are evil, we're like, Jesus is having a bad day or Jesus is in a bad mood or Jesus is kind of testy. Well, not really. What's actually happening is Jesus is speaking not only to their question, but he's speaking to what he knows is behind the question. So last week we looked at this, some pretty cool verses I thought about Jesus casting out evil and we talked about evil and demons. But I wanna go back and read you something. We read it, but I didn't really address it. I wanna show you this is, uh, in a few verses back. It says, but some of them said, they're talking about Jesus, he casts out demons by the devil, the prince of demons, while others to test him kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. So why were they asking Jesus for a sign? Look at it, to test him. Their reason for asking Jesus, hey, do another miracle, do another really cool thing, was not because they wanted to see if Jesus really was the son of God or prove that he was great. They were doing it to test him. They already had a purpose for Jesus, which was getting him out of their religious world. These were the religious leaders and the religious teachers. And so um, Jesus knew that. It's like if you, I hope you don't have this, but if you had somebody in your life who's sort of out to get you or threatening you or saying mean things against you and you see them out in public today or out in Publix today, wherever you may be, and they say, hey, how are you doing? Well, you might not just answer that question, right? Because you know all this other stuff that's going on. And so when they're asking Jesus for a sign, uh, he knows that there's other stuff going on. And, and Jesus is speaking out of the pressure that is mounting. There's a bunch of other stuff that's been going on. Uh, the other day I was driving around and, uh, in traffic and this guy, I did something this guy didn't like and he gave me a sign, okay? Um, <laughs> Actually, I was with Pastor Mark and he said, I think he gave you the double sign. I was like, what? Which is impressive because you only have two hands and you're driving and all that. But it wasn't impressive. It was, it was bad. And if you're in the room, that's, up, that's on you, man. Um, but what I, try to t what I try to ask myself when somebody is doing that, I try to remind myself so I don't just match the energy, you know, uh, which is my tendency, uh, is perhaps there's been something going on in this person's life. You know, this is probably not uh, just, uh, 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 it's probably not just me, but there's probably been a lot building up. This is a, an expression of a lot of other pressure that's been mounting. Uh, this is not the best example with Jesus because it's just not the best example. Uh, but uh, what we do see here is that there's been a lot going on. And so when he speaks and says, uh, you evil generation, or in Matthew, the same uh, story being told, he says, you evil and adulterous people. When you hear these words from Jesus, we know that's because there's been a lot been going on, there's been a lot mounting there. And what Jesus understands is the motive behind their demand for him to show them a sign. He knows what's going on in their hearts. Uh, my girls, I have three girls, and sometimes they'll ask me to participate in a, uh, a TikTok with them, a dance. You know, there are these dances that are choreographed. You know, Eddie, don't look at me like you don't know. Uh, and they ask you to do these dances. And so uh, usually when they ask me, hey, Dad, will you do this TikTok dance with me? I'm a little flattered, you know, and I realize they probably heard about my dance moves in the old days or something like that, you know? And so uh, I join in with them. But what I realize after I watch the TikTok or I see their response is they had a different motive in asking me to do that dance, you know what I mean? It wasn't that I was a great dancer, it's just that uh, I, don't, I don't actually don't know. It's gonna get them a lot of views or, or something like that. And so sometimes when they ask me, I say, I know what you're up to, I know what you're up to. And this is what Jesus is saying to those folks. I know what you guys are up to, you evil generation. I know that you're not just wanting me to do something beautiful that God has given me the power to do, that you have a motive behind that. And he says, so you're asking for a sign. This is a really peculiar, interesting kind of way that Jesus talks, okay? He says, you're asking for a sign. No sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. So Jesus says, I'm not gonna give you a sign, but what I am gonna give you is a sign, that's how Jesus talks sometimes because he is, he's always breaking down our normal ways of thinking and looking at things. There's something deeper that he's trying to say. He says, you want me to do a sign? Well, the only sign you're gonna get is Jonah. 
So that's sort of why Jesus is saying these things. It's coming from a place not of actually wanting to meet a, a, a real inquiry from them to see who he is, but they're actually accusing him. That's the why. So now we're gonna look at what Jesus actually said. I wanna show you the verses again, two of them specifically, so we can, you can really hear the words that Jesus actually said. He said, for as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. So, we're about to get to what Jesus means by what he's saying, but if we have any hope of understanding what Jesus means by Jonah, then we have to understand what Jonah meant to Nineveh, right? That's gonna, do, that, that's gonna require a little bit of digging on our part. Here's the other thing that Jesus actually said. The queen of the south, or in some version it says the queen of Sheba, will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. We have to remember, so uh, you know, if we're gonna understand what Jesus means by then, then we have to understand who the queen of the south is, what, what her connection to Solomon was and what that means to the people of God. And so the people that Jesus is talking to or addressing in this place, remember, are experts in the law. They're experts in the ancient prophecies of God. And so things that are, we have to do a little bit digging because we've got literal thousands of years from when the Queen of the South actually lived in the southern part of Arabia, which is, in, is a real place south of Saudi Arabia. There's a, there's a country called Yemen. That's where this Queen of the South or the Queen of Sheba lived in this time. We'd have to do a lot of digging to get there, right? But what Jesus is saying about Jonah and Solomon, two heroes of their faith, they were experts in it. He says, I'm greater than Jonah and I'm greater than Solomon, which would have really ticked them off, okay? So I wanna look at those things. I wanna look first at this queen of the south. Uh, I do not think this is the main thrust of what Jesus is trying to teach here, so we're just gonna look at it really quick, but it is pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, and then we'll look at the sign of Jonah because I think that is really the main thrust of what Jesus is saying. But uh, you look fascinated, this is great. Um, I, had, I had in my notes you know, right here, look up and make sure everyone, people are still in the room, okay? So <laughs> the queen of the south was this real queen who lived, like I said, in the most southern part of Arabia hundreds of years before Jesus. Uh, in the time when a new nation had arisen north of there, a brand new nation of people, a ragtag group of people that uh, just before had been slaves and then wandered in the wilderness, the nation of Israel. And they had one of their first kings, not their first king, but pretty close. And his name was Solomon. And people were actually starting to hear about Solomon all around the area because he was uh, significant and in some ways magnificent. He was so smart, people were saying, you've never met someone with the intelligence of Solomon. So the queen of Sheba travels hundreds of miles to the place where Solomon lives to inquire of him, see the similarity? To ask him hard questions, to find out if he really is somebody great. It's, you can read about it in 1 Kings. And so the queen of the south comes to Solomon, it says, and asked him hard questions to test his intelligence. And what she found is, is that Solomon was everything that she'd heard about. Every rumor was true. She'd never met anybody like him. And so the inquiry and the hard questions led to an understanding that this king was great. And Jesus says that to these guys, and he says, there's one greater than Solomon in your midst. The sign of Jonah would be something more of us have heard about and probably more of them. You've probably heard about Jonah and the whale. But there's a lot going on with Jonah. We can't do the whole book of Jonah right now, but it's an interesting story about someone who feels called by God, but he's got a really hard thing to do, and he ends up in the belly of a whale. And the story says that he stays in the whale, which to the ancient people, ancient Hebrew people, a whale or a sea monster, as it was described, would represent death. And so Jonah goes into death in the belly of a fish, in the belly of the sea for three days. And then after three days, the one who is dead actually isn't dead, he's alive, Jonah. And Jonah's one thing that he does after he'd been dead for three days is he goes and preaches to an undeserving people that even though they've done all kinds of things that should make them undeserving of the love of God, the love of God is pursuing them from this one once dead who's now alive telling them that all they have to do is turn their hearts back to God and they do and the whole city of Nineveh is saved. And so what Jonah meant to Nineveh, Jesus says, I will mean to you I'm not gonna give you a sign like you're asking for. What I'm gonna give you is the sign of Jonah. What is the sign of Jonah? 
One who is three days dead, who is alive again, who goes and preaches good news to the undeserving. Jesus is saying to his accusers, you are seeking out to kill me, and I am going to let you kill me, but my death will not thwart the plans of God. Did they understand all that in that moment? Probably not, but they logged it away in their minds. We're talking about it today. And so the sign of Jonah became something that they remembered when one three days dead started walking around, speaking to the undeserving. Is he like Jonah? He's like Jonah, but Jesus says, it'll be greater than Jonah. (laughs) Now, we're trying to uncover some of these mysteries of the depth of the scriptures, which are amazing, which we're just barely dipping our toe into. But when you are accusing someone, you don't have the openness of a heart like I asked you to have when we started this. All you're listening for is more to accuse. And so what the people who are listening to Jesus heard is, he says he's greater than Jonah, and he says he's greater than Solomon. Those are our heroes. And so they use that even more to convict him and to kill him. If you ever wanna make somebody mad, find out who they hold in high esteem and talk about them as if they are in lower esteem. That's what Jesus does. Why, because he's trying to pick on them because he's getting involved in some kind of fight? No, he's trying to jar their minds and their hearts out of their crusty religious conventions to show them that it's not just about their study and their story and their history that will save them. It is a God who will go to the full depths of any measure needed to save the undeserving. (laughs) And so I ask, you know, when we look at that, so what does that mean for us? So what? Are we just here to, you know, read an old book? No, it's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What does it mean for us, guys? Is it worth it to go 46 weeks in to the book of Luke to an inspired, uh, to inspired pages about Jesus? I think so. And there's a hard lesson in this. It's what no one wants to learn when they're studying the gospels and you hear about these religious leaders, the Pharisees, uh, the teachers of the law, because they're painted as the villains. And we kind of like, it's good to have a villain, right? It's like, they're the, vil- they're the bad guys. We understand who the good guys are. That's the disciples. Jesus is the hero. But if you read the book of Luke, what, you, what you'll realize he's trying to show us is uh, we are like the, the villains. He's trying to paint a picture where we would begin to identify with those who are coming against Jesus. Why? Because it will shake us from our conventions to have open hearts to what God is really saying. So here's a question I see, a so what question in the sign of Jonah. Have I put my whole trust in Jesus or do I need him to do more? I just want you to ask yourself that. Like, have I put my whole trust in Jesus or do I still need him to do something more? It's really okay if you say, you know what? If I'm honest, I'm needing Jesus to do some more things. (laughs) That's how we walk in this broken, hard world so much. It's like, I love you, Jesus, but I need you to come through. I love you, Jesus, but I still need you to do this one thing. I love you, Jesus, but I've got this this broken place that unless you fix, I'm not gonna be able to fully live. What What I wanna invite you to do, and this is the step of faith, and this is what the invitation is from Jesus, is to put your whole trust in Jesus based on who he is, not on what he still has yet to do for you. To put your whole trust in him, to trust him, that he is who he says he is, and then those more things will come. We've been studying Jesus. We know that he cares about all those more things that are coming for us, but the danger is when we still have yet some yet agenda for Jesus to fulfill for us, that agenda is, is usually our agenda for how we want our life to work out, how we want our finances to work out, how we want our health to work out, how we want our kids to work out, how we want our retirement to work out, and Jesus, is coming to you as the king, greater than Jonah, (laughs) greater than Solomon. You accept him and those more things come on his agenda, not yours. We're in week 46, guys. This is not elementary school teachings that Jesus has given to the disciples. These are hard teachings. That's actually what they're called. uh, that's, That's what they've been called by the ancients of Christianity, the hard teachings of Jesus. And the hard teachings of Jesus lead us to a fully submitted life to God. And that's the life where we actually find the more. And so um, I have have one other question for you. The other question has to do uh, with your heroes. And that is, have you put more trust in Jesus or in some other hero? 
what he was showing those religious leaders is that they had lifted up some heroes that were not God. They can actually become idols. And so I want you to think about today. Do I trust Jesus more or some of my heroes? Who are your heroes? For some of us, our 401k is our hero. For some of us, our news station is our hero. That's what's teaching us and discipling us. You know, for some of us, it's our plan for how our life is going to go. That's my hero. I've lifted it up higher. In this time, uh, as we head towards, uh, you know, a big election in our country, I'm going to warn you not to make a political party or a candidate your hero more than Jesus. Because Jesus' teaching does not ever submit itself to any other leader or any other king, the Queen of Sheba, Solomon. No one rises to the level of Jesus. And so we put our full trust in him. And all the, other, all the other heroes have to find themselves lower. So what is the sign of Jonah? The sign of Jonah is that one who we believe to be dead three days is actually, through the power of God, alive. And on the other side of that death, he's preaching a message to the undeserving that even the undeserving have hope with God. And just like Nineveh, who had no hope and no reason for hope, if they open their hearts to God, they can return to him fully. That invitation was open to the people that Jesus was talking to 2,000 years ago, and it's open to us. And that's why today we give thanks for the sign of Jonah. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. God, thank you for continuing to teach us through um, your holy inspired word. It's really crazy and amazing. And... Um, we just thank you that for the real Jesus who speaks to our hearts, even when he asks hard questions and even when he seems hard to understand. We love Jesus. We want him. He is our king. He's the one we look to. So as we come forward now for Holy Communion, let it be for us a meeting place with him, our true king, the one we love. We remember his broken body on the cross, his sacrifice, his blood shed for the forgiveness of sins, which means the undeserving ones like us get all the life and all the hope and all the benefit of Christ's sacrifice. Help us to remember that in communion this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.